From this day forward, whenever you think of the holidays, you'll be thinking about a quiver of explosive arrows. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. Folks, I am very pleased today to be discussing the first two episodes of Hawkeye on Disney+. And we have with us the head writer, Jonathan Igla. So, you know, this is a cool discussion in which we could get into the nitty gritty of kind of what it took to get these first two episodes together and start the structure of what technically is about act one out of this six part series. Um, so, you know, there's going to be a lot more to be discussed. Uh, we barely have, have really seen who the real antagonist is and what their goals are. So I know that's coming in the future and we're going to try and do a finale wrap up. But without a doubt, Jonathan was a great interview and was able to elaborate on his creative process of what it took to get Hawkeye made. So I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And you know, kids, it's the holiday season, so you could gift a subscription of Backstory to whoever you would like by going to Backstory.net and uh, getting into our shopping cart there. And just to sweeten the deal, you could use code word save five that'll save you five dollars off a one-year subscription and don't worry if you get it over at backstory.net which is the only place that coupon code works your login credentials will still work either at backstory.net on a desktop or laptop or via our ipad app backstory so uh you know you'll still have plenty of flexibility with that gift subscription if you've never read backstory before and you're on the fence i think you'd like checking out our free issue because it's an avengers in-game issue we interviewed the russo brothers we interviewed the screenwriters there's a lot of great stuff in our free issue and it should tell you whether or not you want to become a backstory subscriber so you could read it for free and I hope you check it out over at Backstory.net or in our app. Of course, our new issue, our Dune issue, is coming out almost any day, and it is a heck of an issue, so I know you'll dig that as well. And I encourage you to check out the table of contents, because this is one packed issue once we publish it. So keep that in mind. We have a new issue coming out very soon. But look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, where video of the Zoom interviews go during the pandemic pandemic, uh, become subscribers to my passion project. So thanks for considering. But now without any further ado, let's jump right into our interview about Hawkeye episodes one and two with head writer, Jonathan Igla. Jonathan, it's good. Uh, it's good to have you on today. Thanks. Thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks. It's my pleasure. So as always, we're going to start spoiler free to give people a sense of who you are and where you come from. And uh, then we're going to get into kind of the nitty gritty uh, with the first two episodes after making a spoiler announcement. So, you know, where are you from? From whence dost thou hail? And what made you decide that you wanted to become a writer? Uh, I am from Brooklyn. Um, I think I, I probably realized that I wanted to be a writer growing up, loving comic books, knowing that I couldn't really draw. And then one day, noticing that there were multiple names in the front of the comic books and realizing that there was somebody um, whose job it was just to write them. Um, and I thought that's a job maybe that I could actually do. And, uh, and then I, and then I thought briefly that I might have the patience to write novels and, and gave it a go when I was maybe eight or nine with my mother's typewriter um, to really date myself. And I did not have the patience. Uh, I, I want to say I made it through about two paragraphs and then really sort of lost my way. Well, it's, it's very well known then, that if you can't write a novel by <laughs> the age of eight or nine, there's really just not much you could do. You know, I was very fortunate that I didn't know that and I kept trying. <laughs> I'm glad that I was ignorant of that, uh, of that uh, obviously uh, true fact. No. Um, <laughs> um, but then I saw a screenplay when I was 13. Um, what was and it? And I, it was Outbreak. I was a big fan of the movie Outbreak and a cousin of mine was friends with, with Wolfgang Peterson and got him to sign a copy of the screenplay for me. Yes, me people the, uh, people have been revisiting Outbreak during the pandemic. Uh, you know, yes. So that's a prescient uh, script you started there with, my friend. <laughs> yeah, it's become relevant again. It felt like it was worthwhile that I had watched it so many times. I was, <laughs> I was so well prepared for the last year and a half. Yeah. Um, but seeing the screenplay, there was a... Um, 
it felt like, oh, I can handle this. There's there's a lot of blank space on a lot of blank space on the pages, and it's it's uh, mostly dialogue, as far as I could tell at the time. And I thought this is something that maybe I could actually do, and I and I started trying it, um, and then um, and then I got into the uh, to the USC uh, that school, as it was known at the time, the School of Cinema Television, now the School of Cinematic Arts. I, got I, I was I was there too. That's awesome, and I got a terrific education, and I got to to trade in high school for learning how to write a movie, which was a, a real, a real upgrade. For well, me. So did you take writing classes at USC? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, it, I was in the writing division, um, which was, um, it, it was a BFA program, which is really only notable because it meant that I had lots of extra credits to dedicate to, to screenwriting classes, as opposed to, um, continuing to pretend that I was going to eventually understand calculus or right. something. Um, and I, yeah, I took, uh, I took very, very little television writing. They made a big shift right after we graduated. I don't want to take credit for it, but certainly on our, like in our, our exit interviews with seniors, we were all um, suggesting that they focus a lot more on television. Um, I took one semester of TV writing at USC and I wrote a spec episode of Scrubs. But in my eight semesters there, I took many, many semesters of feature writing. Well, so, you know, the first credit that I saw for you, if I was, unless I was reading it wrong for writing was, was becoming a story editor on Mad Men. Is that, is that correct? I mean, you know, what, what did you do when you graduated SC? Because it could be a very disorienting time to find your way into the industry and find your first job. It was completely disorienting. And, um, I did start, I did start on Mad Men. I started as the writer's assistant and I, I co-wrote the finale season four with Matt and I was promoted to staff writer um, the credits on IMDb are, uh, I feel like there's somebody I hope is, is waging a battle to try to, to straighten out what a, what a staff writer is and what a story editor is. And there are ancient guild rules that staff writers don't have to be, um, you know, things that we agreed to long, long ago that a staff writer credit doesn't have to appear on screen. So sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it doesn't end up on IMDb. Um, which but- <laughs> finale, which, which season finale did you co-write? Uh, I co-wrote the season four and season five finale. I was the writer's assistant season four. Um, and I wrote the Tomorrowland episode where Don proposes to Megan with Matt. And then in season five, um, I wrote that finale with him as well. And I was the staff writer that season. That's awesome. And then well, I mean, through the end of the show. Tell me what you <laughs> learned from Matt Weiner, uh, because he's so prolific. And I'm sure you picked up on his creative habits. Tell me something that helped inform your running your own show on on Hawkeye. I learned so much from Matt. First, you know, to to sort of bridge the gap and skip a bunch of steps in between. Matt taught for a semester at USC when I was a senior. Uh, he taught a class on rewriting your feature script, and there were eight of us in that section. Um, and uh, I learned so much from him as a professor before he was my boss. He was he was a really great teacher, and and uh, and then I learned so much working on the show from him. There there were. Um, I would say the thing that I find keeps coming up that that I've brought with me into every other writer's room that I've brought with me onto Hawkeye um, that I try to bring into everything that I write is to really uh, imbue the, the world with uh, as much of a three-dimensional feel of reality as you can, which is to say every single character who comes into the show, uh, whether they're coming in for one line and don't even have a proper name or they are, you know, Kate Bishop. Um, these are characters who it's worth spending a minute really thinking about who are they, what are they in the middle of today? What is their attitude? Uh, um, imagining that they are living an entire life and they might be having their day interrupted briefly by Don Draper or by Hawkeye, but that they are living a life that, that existed before they appeared on screen and keeps going afterwards and trying to um to bring that that level of, of thought and care to as many details as possible starting with the people um but but continuing it onward into um into into every place and 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 uh every every prop and every costume and, and everything uh everything that you can give the thought to um there are, are a number of of specific things in the um I mean, very broadly speaking, in my conception of Hawkeye, part of what I was really excited about exploring, and this speaks to this, I think, but in a in a in a large way, um, was the idea that Kate Bishop is part of this next generation of potential heroes like Peter Parker, who grew up in a world where superheroes existed. There's a, a reality there that I think is is fascinating and worth exploring, 
uh, that is not only different from our own reality, although in, in a lot of ways closer to our reality, because, you know, Kate's relationship to the Avengers and to Hawkeye specifically, uh, just like Peter's relationship to Tony Stark and to the Avengers, is in a lot of ways closer to our relationship to them. You know, they, they kind of grew up with them and they idolized them. They could have a poster of these heroes on their wall. They could have an action figure like I had every single action figure. Um, and that was something specifically that I thought was was really a, a new dimension to explore, uh, uh, to dig into the reality of this world that, that uh, Marvel has been building for all this time. That's great. And we're going to come back to that because in the spoiler section, I definitely want to ask you a little more about that. But put us in the room when you pitched for the show, because it's a pretty big deal to walk into Marvel and and to be anointed uh, the head writer of a show. So what was what was it like to to land it? Did you have a formal pitch? Was it written? Was it verbal? Tell us tell us about that experience. Um, it was it was a great pitching experience, and I actually pitched in a style that I'm trying to bring forward with me. Because there is so much secrecy and because um, I had to go in there knowing full well that there was a chance that there was some sort of a 10-point plan for Clint's future, for Kate's future, or something giant that was going to happen in one of the movies that wasn't out yet that might completely torpedo whatever specific ideas I'd had, I had to go in really flexible. Um, And I had to go in really in a way it forced me to just go in and be authentic and not try to guess what they wanted. So I went in with um, I went in with a notebook and a bunch of bullet points, um, and you know, pretty clear idea of what I was going to say, but deliberately trying not to over rehearse it because I wanted it, if possible, to feel like a conversation, which is what it felt like. Um, I just went in and um, you know, first I met with Trin, and um, and then uh, uh, and first I met with Trin sort of more broadly, and then I met with Trin again and pitched a, a bunch of these ideas, basically just telling her what I was excited about, what I would want to explore in the show if I were, were lucky enough to get the opportunity. And then um, I met again with, with Kevin and Lou and Victoria, um, you know, in the Avengers conference room, which was um, just cool to get to go to. I remember beforehand really thinking, you know, try not, this is obviously impossible, but try not to worry too much about whether you get the job, just enjoy the opportunity, go in and talk to the people in charge of making these movies you love and, and, and take that as a victory. That's great so advice. As much as I was able to, <laughs> to trick myself into trying to do that. Um, I tried to do that. And, and I went in and we talked, um, uh, Kevin and I talked about Mad Men for a while. Um, every so often there are, there are helpful anecdotes like, um, like that I, I'm an extra in the finale of Mad Men that if you were a fan of the show becomes something fun to talk about and, and helped me help me relax and, and um, not feel like I was in the spotlight from the, from the first moment. That's very cool. Um, well, well, so did you, did you have it kind of hashed out to, you know, since we're in the non spoiler section, what people would know from the trailer, it's, you know, it's, it's right before Christmas. Clint wants to get home to his family, but he's drawn into some drama, you know, was it, was it kind of on those, those tropes? So Christmas honestly came later. Um, that was something that that I came up with in the room with the team, uh, which I'm really glad that we came to. Um, it was mostly focused on um, on Kate, on her origin and her arc and her childhood, um, sort of her childhood backstory, and on, sure. on the dynamic between Kate and Clint, and then uh, a handful of other uh, specifics and broad ideas, some of which are are in the show exactly the way that I pitched them and. And the rest of which I, I think I probably have forgotten um, because, you know, there have been a million other iterations of things right. in between then and now. Well, you know, something um, that's so fascinating about, about working with Marvel that I think has worked excellently for them is they really seem to have this old Hollywood, you know, writer's barracks in which people working on different Marvel shows and movies collaborate with each other. There's a story department, you know, kind of the way that Pixar and Disney animation also have story departments. Tell us about integrating with, with Marvel story department and, and picking up on the necessities of, like you said before, things that might need to be known for future projects, but also really just the history because they have the archives as well. Um, you know, my, my, the experience on Hawkeye was largely um, 
I don't want to say it was it was a more traditional television setup, but it was a lot closer to a traditional television setup than than what you've just described. I um, I just hired a writing staff, and we had uh, uh, you know we had twenty weeks of, of writers room breaking stories and, and putting together outlines, and then everybody writing their drafts. Um, How many people were on your staff? You know, I have to count every single time. Uh, I think <laughs> there were seven. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I tried to run it kind of taking all of the best things from, from the, from the showrunners that I've, I've worked for over the years. I've had, uh, I've, I've, I've worked in a lot of different rooms and I've worked for a bunch of different showrunners and with a lot of other showrunners, even if they weren't the showrunner on the project that I was working with them on. So I, I tried to take as many of the different, um, best qualities as I could and, and bring them with me. Um, in terms of integrating into the larger, uh, Marvel tapestry, which is, an incredible uh it's an incredible privilege and responsibility um a lot of it is really um a lot of it is a little bit like playing the game operation where you're just sort of waiting to find out with a buzz that you've hit something that you can't do um you know i i will say in the first few weeks in the writer's room a phrase that we heard a lot was falcon and winter soldier is doing that you know they were several months ahead of us um, and, uh, I think that, that a handful of our first instincts went in similar directions. Um, and then every so often there would be a sort of, <laughs> a sort of vague nondescript, you can't do that, uh, without an explanation that we would then all be really, really desperate to find out what the explanation was. Since it's something that Falcon and Winter Soldier did, and that's already out. Do you want to give us a fun example of something that you were thinking of doing that ultimately became a part of the Falcon and Winter Soldier series that we already know? Um, at the very, very beginning of, of the writer's room, um, I was more thinking about Clint's emotional state immediately after Endgame and was thinking about setting the show much closer to the end of those movies, which I think very wisely, uh, we decided not to do. I, I think I was, I was honestly pretty torn artistically between the idea of picking up where we last saw him, which was obviously the most immediate emotional thing on my mind thinking about what comes next for clint right. and also something that i i i really prize um as a viewer which is feeling like the an ongoing series or, or or a series of movies which really nobody other than marvel really does this right um but that they allow the characters to have a similar uh emotional evolution to the fans and i think we we made the right choice to let some time pass so that clint had had a similar amount of time to absorb the events of, of Endgame to the audience, Clint and the entire rest of the world. Um, but initially, because we were talking about the show possibly taking place much closer to the end of the blip, we started talking about people who were refugees as a result of the blip. It seemed like the type of thing that maybe, uh, you know, Kate would be inspired to try to help out with. Um, but, uh, uh, obviously that was a, a really, a, a huge element in Falcon and Winter Soldier. <laughs> yeah. Um, and That's because we then moved forward in time, we, uh, uh, we were, you know, um, uh, I was going to say, we let them have it. That, that really confers way too much power and generosity on my part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take it. Well, I mean, it was, and it, and it made sense for them to use that too. I mean, I thought that was what I really Absolutely. liked about that show was the realism of the consequences of what happened because it showed that even though end game had a win there were still people suffering so that was great for them to have but you know moving on absolutely yes yeah. I, I i want to talk about your creative habit for a second how important is outlining to your process when you sit down to write i think it's essential i i, I have um when i was younger i definitely had the fantasy that i didn't need to <laughs> um you know, after uh, after Hawkeye, I I wanted to have like a a, um, a completely unencumbered, free creative process, and I I tried to to go into something that I was writing just for myself without an outline, and thought that I could you know that it would be fun to find it on my own, and and I reminded myself that this is too much freedom uh, that I was giving myself. I would sit down to to try to work on the next scene in the feature that I was that I was really. Uh, exploring is, is really the most generous way to describe it. And I was exploring a, a, a completely dark room um, without an outline to follow. I, I think ideally for me, if I'm, if I'm working just for myself and this isn't an outline that I'm, that I'm crafting or that I'm crafting with the team to help um, producers or director see what the script is going to be. If it's just for me, then I want flexibility in there. I want to know 
um, enough of the 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 sort of the way in and the way out of the scene, and enough of what the the conflict is and what the stakes are. You know, I think in a lot of ways, every scene is is the same as as uh, an episode of TV or a movie. Every scene should have stakes and a goal and an obstacle. Um, every scene should have a point. Um, so I, I I think it is. Um, I, I reminded myself through that experiment that I need that, um, that I need at least that. And then if I'm, if it's, uh, if it's an outline for a show that is going to be read by more people, especially people who weren't in the writer's room, then it needs quite a lot more detail. The outlines on Hawkeye were very, very detailed. They were, how, how um, many pages would you say they were for each episode? Um, low twenties. Oh, wow. Okay. That's great. You said you had 20 weeks to break those yeah. outlines. Yeah, we did. Well, 20 weeks to, to break the outlines and to write the, the first draft of the script. Oh, okay. Okay. So first Basically. draft of the script as well. I, I mean, you know, why six episodes? Some people have asked, it could have been eight. It could have been 10. How'd you arrive at six, which is two episodes equaling one act of your structure. <laughs> um, You know, the short answer is that it was it was a decision that was made by um, by Marvel and Disney and Disney Plus. I'm guessing. Uh, I think it's the right number. I, I think that there is a um, um, there is a needle that that Marvel is threading right now, and so far, I think uh, really successfully in taking these characters who have felt so exclusive and so rare because they only appear on the big screen and only every couple of years, and giving us more of them, which is you know, what we have all been clamoring for, um, but not giving us uh, so much of it that it, it starts to feel less special than, than they are. Uh, I think that um, six hours is a good limited series length. You know, it's not actually six hours. The episodes are, are, are shorter than that. Um, but it is six one hour episodes. I think it is a good miniseries length. I mean, truthfully, I've worked on shows that are all different lengths. I think for a writer, the most important thing is just to know what the target is. You know, Great. Bridgerton, we did eight hours and, you know, the Mad Men seasons were all 13, except the last season we did two halves of seven, which we which we broke consecutively, but we knew were going to be aired that way. So we wrote it with, you know, two season premieres and two finales. Um, for Hawkeye, knowing from the beginning that six hours was the target and that it was going to be distributed in a more traditional weekly format, uh, obviously, the first two episodes are dropping together, which I'm very excited about. Um, but beyond that, knowing that the episodes are going to be released one at a time was as important as knowing the ultimate length, because sure. it really, um, for me, it really informs the style of storytelling. I think you have to try to account for the fact that fans who are really dedicated fans are going to spend a lot of time thinking between the episodes. Um and and it 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 is harder to stay ahead of an audience that has a week to ponder between episodes than it is if the audience is getting to plow through it all at the same time. Um, and I think it also it the different formats ask for for different things of of the creators. I think that um, you know a show that a show like Bridgerton that is released all together, you you really want to craft it in a way where people can't stop watching it. Um, but a show that's going to air week to week, uh, as much as is possible, you want to make the, the individual episodes both, uh, make it so that you absolutely have to tune in next week, which I think we, we do a pretty good job of doing, but also to make it feel like each week you're getting a satisfying experience. That makes sense. Ooh, Hey, I'm just jumping in really quick to remind you to check out backstory magazine over at backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. You know, we have a new issue coming out. It's our Dune issue. It's coming out any minute, practically, and uh, it is going to be packed. There is going to be so much cool stuff in it. So it is a perfect time to subscribe to Backstory magazine. And I hope you check out our table of contents once the Dune issue is released, because you're going to love what's inside. If you've never read us before, I hope you consider test driving us. And our free issue is an Avengers Endgame issue, actually. So for Marvel fans out there, I know you will dig this issue. And uh, look, after you've checked us out at Backstory.net or via our iPad app by reading the free issue, I hope you consider becoming a subscriber. And if you want to subscribe, I'm here to sweeten the deal 
with coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and you could enter it over at Backstory.net, and it will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. And remember, folks, it's the holiday season, so you could give a gift subscription to whoever you would like, and uh, they'll be able to read it as well. But look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page consider supporting my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our interview about Hawkeye episodes one and two with head writer Jonathan Igla. One last question before we jump into the spoilers. When you sit down to write, um, how many hours a day do you give yourself to write? Or did you give yourself a specific page count that you want to hit each day? Just really briefly. For Hawkeye, I tried to break it into two work sessions for myself, um, about three hours at a time. Um, It was... um, I have found as I have gotten older that I am actually, as a rule and over time, more productive and more prolific if I have less time at the computer and more time doing my best not to think about it. Uh, with Hawkeye, there was a, a, a lot of work that needed doing and um, you know, never enough time. Is that the classic writer's Please. deadline creeping up on you that, that kind of when you give yourself less time, it makes you hyper-focus? I'm sure that there's some element of that. Certainly, uh, I've always been helped by a deadline. You know, I think um, even going back to school, I, 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 I almost always hit my deadline. So I think I, I do benefit from them. I think it's probably different for everybody what the number is, but there is just an amount of creative work that I have in me. And I could pretend that I'm going to spend eight hours trying to get it all out before I could acknowledge that I, I, I'm going to do it in, in three hours, in two different sessions, and then not spend a lot of time procrastinating. That makes sense. Well, look, I want to I want to get into the spoilers. So, podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify, YouTube watchers on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page if you have not yet seen the first two episodes of Hawkeye, press pause cuz we're going to get into the spoilers. Come back and then finish the episode. You know, as you said, starting with Kate's backstory, it was great to see her witness the the battle for New York City in Avengers 2012 and to idolize Hawkeye. Was was that just kind of an initial thought that came about for for showing that backstory? Because, you know, as the other show, Falcon and Winter Soldier has both names of their characters. This could have easily been called Hawkeye and, you know, Kate Bishop. So so it was great to start there. And not everybody expected that. I, I'm glad it was it was one of the very first things that I came up with. Um there were there were a number of different thoughts that went into it, aside from just that it would be fun to see it from her perspective. I say fun, although this is obviously a deeply, deeply traumatizing moment for her. I mean, fun in a very particular sense. <laughs> um, a couple of things that I that I thought this could accomplish. For one thing, I wanted to establish that Kate was important in this series. Not um, she's not a secondary character. She is the other lead of the show. So starting the show with her, I think, was a really good way to establish that from the jump. Um, it also speaks to this notion that I was talking a little bit about earlier about the reality and three-dimensional world that these characters live in. This event happened in New York where millions and millions of people live. As soon as I started thinking about Kate and her childhood, Kate to me is a quintessential New Yorker. She feels very much like a, like, like a, like a kid who grew up in Manhattan. I thought she was probably there that day. Um, and, um, and then I thought... I started thinking about what is it that, that makes somebody want to be a superhero? Uh, what kind of childhood would do it? And, um, and I'm, I'm always interested in, in sort of twinning psychological events. So, so what you have in the pilot, in the opening of the show, is Kate losing her father and also witnessing this terrifying alien invasion. And in this moment where you have a little child feeling completely out of control, obviously she doesn't know that her father is gone yet in that moment, but she will pair that trauma with this moment. You have a little girl who's completely out of control, and what she sees out her window is a person who she will soon understand has no superpowers, but has a bow and arrow and doesn't look out of control. And that becomes the thing that she grabs onto. That's that's what I want to do to feel in control. I want to be like that. It's it's a great moment. And, and you know, the medals that we see her accumulate shows her years of training, which makes sense as to why she has all these skills. So that was fantastic as well. What rewrites were important for you due to the pandemic? We could see in the LARPing scene that a few people have masks on here and there in the background. And, you know, this has been a challenge for all screenwriters. 
I'm just curious how you guys rose to the occasion uh, to to complete what you did during the pandemic. It was more of a production challenge than a writing challenge. Uh, I, I think okay. by and large, they were able to to uh, to just figure out how to work around it. Certainly, a lot of a lot of the scenes lent themselves to it. <laughs> there were scenes with costumes, uh, with masks that uh, that helped. Were, you, with it. were um, your scripts done before the pandemic started? Basically, no. Okay. Um, uh, we, we, we kept going into the pandemic. The, the timing of it was convenient for the writer's room. Yeah. The, the rewriting continued through that process. Okay. There were a lot of, uh, long zoom calls with, uh, with Reese and, and Trin. There was, there was a great piece of realism in which, you know, Rogers, the musical was hilarious and, uh, I would watch 10 more minutes of it for sure. But, uh, you, you hit us with the realism of Hawkeye being through all these battles, wearing a hearing aid. Um, and you know, losing some of his hearing, which I, I thought was really, really great and shows a vulnerability and a realism. When did that idea come about? It, it came about pretty early. You know, it's, it's in that the, the terrific Matt Fraction's Biraha run. Um, I also really wanted to show that the, the bumps and bruises that he has taken over the years left some sort of a, 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 a permanent mark on him. Um, and this was a, a much uh, clearer and stronger way to show it than just that he is, you know, a little bit creaky or something. This is a way to show that his life has permanently changed by some of the uh, some of the blows that he has taken over the years, which I think is really important. Um, it's really important in, in, in establishing um, for a potentially new audience and reminding the existing audience and just sort of establishing where we are in, in, in his life that this is a guy without superpowers. He does not have super soldier serum running through his veins. He is uh, he is in great shape, but he is a human being. And when he and when he's in a whole bunch of explosions, there's a chance that he's going to lose his hearing, just like yeah. any of us would. It, it, it was it was it was really a nice touch that I liked. I mean, you know, look, you're two episodes in. The antagonists, probably plural, are emerging. It's clear that Jack is one of them. Something that I really liked that you did, rather than telling us, you were showing us with Jack, in which you set up the um, monogrammed candy in Armand the third's apartment um, when Kate is sneaking in and you see Jack present her one and it's you know like look in classic film terms it's the key and Hitchcock's notorious it's it's something that is a token that the audience needs to remember rather than expressing it through dialogue tell us about that revelation moment because it was it was really cool to see something like that well what I'll say is we don't know if Jack is an antagonist and you know, Armand is Jack's uncle. There's a completely innocuous reason why he might have one of those. This is true. This is true. We'll talk more about that in the uh, in the in in our in our next podcast that we do together because okay. it it seems to suggest something. But you are absolutely right. It could be completely innocuous. Um, look, it's always interesting to hear what was your toughest scene. Um, what was the scene that you kept coming back to over and over for these two episodes? Um, it could be two different scenes if you want, but. What was the scene that you kept coming back to and how did you creatively, uh, you know, break through on, on, on the challenge? That is a good question. I would say the whole opening sequence, which, um, which I worked on a lot with, with my partner, Elisa Clement, who was my number two on the show. Um, you know, it didn't, it didn't substantively change all that much, but in the details of it, it changed a lot and, uh, and is ultimately, um, as virtually everything is shorter than the first and second and third way that I or we wrote it. Um, but that, I think just because of how important it was as the opening of the show, uh, as our introduction to Kate, um, you know, the first moment where we're establishing her parents and her and introducing her to the world and introducing her to Hawkeye, there was a lot that, that needed to get done. Um, and we just spent a lot of time honing it and, and trying out different ideas and, um, and a lot of time trying to make it shorter and still maintain uh, um, everything that we needed to do, um, including, you know, she has very, very little uh, screen time with her dad, but you need to feel the loss of Derek in the show, which means that we had to establish a rapport between them and establish the dynamic that Kate had with each of her parents as, as quickly and efficiently as possible while making it feel lived in and real. Um, and, and leaving enough of, of an emotional impact on, on Kate and on the audience to carry forward. 
Well, you certainly accomplished that. I cannot wait to see the next three episodes. And thanks for being so generous with your time and, and congrats on leading us through Hawkeye and uh, seeing where it's all going to end up. I look forward to talking to you again after the season wraps. All right. Thanks very much. Me too. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to Hawkeye episodes one and two head writer Jonathan Igla for being so generous with his time. And hopefully we'll be able to do a wrap up episode talking about uh, all the secrets of the season after it completes. But uh, thanks again to Jonathan for a great interview. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. If you've never read us before, I encourage you to test drive us and we have our free issue that you could read through the Backstory app on an iPad or at Backstory.net on a desktop or laptop. It's our Avengers Endgame issue, so it should appeal to Marvel fans. And after you read it, you should know if you want to become a subscriber and support us. And uh, if you do, I'm here to sweeten the deal with coupon code SAVE5. That's save and the number five, and it will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. This is a perfect time to get in on Backstory because we are ready to release our Dune issue any day now, and it is going to be packed with stuff you're absolutely going to love. So I hope you check out the table of contents after we publish it. And remember, since it's the holidays, you could give a gift subscription to Backstory Magazine, and I hope you consider doing that as well. It's easy to do over at Backstory.net. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021. All rights reserved. Folks, if you want to reach out to me, you could find me as Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter. Or you could find those same two accounts on Instagram as Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. I have a Facebook fan page that I check sometime. If you want to send me an email, you could write into backstoryletters at gmail.com. That inbox gets a little clogged, but I do try and go through it and I do try and respond to as many folks as I can. And it's always fun to hear from you. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A. Thank you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.